Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from the Center for International Private Enterprise. My name is Rajana, and I'm the Program Officer for SIPE's Representative Office here in the Philippines. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar. Uh, we're going to get started soon, but we'd like to start off with a message from our Executive Director, Andrew Wilson. Good morning, everyone, and good evening to those joining us from Washington. Welcome to the third webinar, SIPE's Manila Virtual Series on Democracy and Technology, hosted by our Philippines office. I'm Andrew Wilson, the Executive Director of the Center for International Private Enterprise. Thank you for joining us today, and if you haven't watched our previous webinars on co-regulation and digital rights, I encourage you to do so. Today's discussion, entrepreneurial resilience in the aftermath of COVID-19, is near and dear to me. I have worked with the private sector for many years and during extremely complex times in the wake of wars, climate disasters, and democratic beginnings. What many small and medium businesses are facing today is unparalleled, both in terms of its challenges as well as its opportunities. While the pandemic has upended so much of our physical lives, technology has offered new tools for how we shop, conduct business, communicate with our families and friends, and how we engage with government and one another across the globe. For instance, I imagine this is not your first Zoom meeting. Importantly, we've witnessed the resilience of small businesses in our own communities as they move online, offered new services, and even contributed to the COVID-19 response by making PPE, hand sanitizer, or offering delivery services for those unable to leave their homes. While the pandemic unfortunately seems far from over in many parts of the globe, there is tremendous work to do right now to support entrepreneurial resilience and ensure that our economies maintain room for small businesses and innovative ideas and solutions. Resiliency is not just an important quality for any entrepreneur. It also must be a public policy objective for economic recovery through public-private cooperation and targeted support and services for small business. Today's discussion is an opportunity to share perspectives on entrepreneurial resilience and begin building a roadmap for inclusive and sustainable business ecosystems throughout Southeast Asia and beyond. Many thanks to today's panelists for contributing to the series, and we appreciate all of you for joining us today. Please keep in touch with SIPE as we all navigate what comes next. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Trujana Pinamecha, Program Officer at SIPE Philippines, to moderate today's event. Trujana? Thank you, Andrew, for opening our session. A warm welcome again, everyone, to our third and final event of our Manila virtual series on democracy and technology. Today, it is my great pleasure to moderate our panel of distinguished guests on the topic of entrepreneurial resilience in the aftermath of COVID-19. COVID-19 has brought a permanent and massive digital adoption surge. In the wake of the pandemic, many business owners have had to rapidly adapt their businesses to new circumstances and leverage new technologies, digital platforms, and payment options out of necessity. While the pandemic accelerated the adoption and use of digital technologies, it has also highlighted critical areas for improvement. Indeed, while digital transformation has been hailed by many as an end to economic recovery and prosperity, innumerable challenges abound once businesses move online. These challenges range from a lack of reliable, affordable internet access, a mismatch in the skills of the workforce and the jobs of the future in digital economy, logistics costs for cross-border e-commerce and trade, competition with global e-commerce giants, as well as data privacy, cybersecurity, and consumer protection concerns. The rapid pace of digitalization in the economy is driven by the private sector, and micro, small, and medium enterprises are at the heart of this growth in Southeast Asia. MSMEs account for around 95% of the all business establishments and more than half of the total employment in all ASEAN member countries. It is thus crucial for governments to work closely with the private sector and civil society to ensure that MSMEs are able to access, contribute, grow, and thrive in this new digital era. A flexible policy and regulatory environment can nurture growth and support a stronger enterprise ecosystem 
in which small business is able to participate in, innovate, and compete in the digital economy. Additionally, investments in digital skills training and literacy and targeted support for businesses, especially women entrepreneurs, rural communities, and the underserved populations, is key to reducing the digital divide and ensuring that growth and participation in the digital economy is inclusive and sustainable. Our first webinar in the series addressed how government and private sector can cooperate to advance inclusive digital transformation through co-regulation. Our second focused on digital rights and how the private sector can strengthen commitments to trust, privacy, and security. Our third webinar focuses on entrepreneurship. And today we are joined by four excellent panelists who will be able to offer perspectives on business resiliency challenges and opportunities for entrepreneurs in this ever-changing digital landscape, as well as the adjustments with the adoption of new technologies and use of online platforms in the aftermath of COVID-19. For a bit of housekeeping first, uh, we'll, we'll begin with about seven minute presentations from each of our panelists, followed by questions that I have prepared for our speakers as part of the panel discussion. We will also have a 15 minute Q&A with the audience. And I ask everyone to please use the Q&A box on the Zoom screen, to, it's at the bottom of your Zoom screen to send in your questions and we'll do our best to answer all of them. Finally, my colleague Ryan Evangelista will close us out with some final thoughts. Please note as well that this session is being recorded and streamed live on Facebook, and we will be sharing the presentations of our panelists afterwards. Now, I will go ahead and introduce each of our panelists in the order of their presentations. First, we have Ms. Gina Romero. Gina is the co-founder and CEO of Connected Women, a social impact tech startup that matches talented Filipino women with meaningful remote work opportunities. She's an unconventional entrepreneur, community builder, and technology advocate. Gina founded Connected Women in 2013 as part of her mission to better equip women entrepreneurs and professionals with the technology skills to scale their businesses and careers. Second, we have Weck de Guzman, who is the founder and CEO of Social Philo, a digital marketing agency with offices in the Philippines and in Australia. Weck and his team in Social Philo help small to enterprise level clients achieve meaningful brand conversations across digital channels. Wack had a successful career in advertising and marketing industry before he ventured into entrepreneurship and founded Social Philo. Third, we have Rachel, who is the founder and CEO of Kairos International Marketing Group, which was established in 2017 and has offices in Taipei and Shanghai. Rachel has expertise in cross-border e-commerce consulting and integrated marketing services in Asia. Her company has its online stores on Alibaba, Taobao, Lazada, and Shopee, as well as other platforms in Asia. In addition to brand customers, her company assisted Kaohsiung City in Taiwan to establish their online cross-border e-commerce platforms in 2018 and 2020. Last but not least is Mr. Zakir Mahmoud, who serves as the director of the Small and Medium Enterprise Center in the Faculty of Economics and Business at the University of Indonesia, where he spearheads various research and programs related to small and medium enterprises. He has also served as an advisor to the Indonesian Ministry of Industry and as a senior advisor to the scientific director of the Jamil Poverty Action Lab in Southeast Asia. So with that, I will now turn the floor over to our panelists for their presentations, starting with Gina. Gina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. My name is Gina Romero and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Connected Women. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share a little bit about um, what we do. So a little bit of trivia about me. I'm a Filipina. My mom was actually one of the early domestic workers who left the country back in the early 70s to go to the UK to look for job opportunities. And as a result of that upbringing, I met many Filipinos all through my life who had left the country in search of other opportunities abroad. And I'm sure that those of you who are listening in from other countries can also relate to this dilemma. Sadly, in many decades since, um, since my mom went back to the UK or went to work in the UK, the, the, the solution hasn't seemed to have um, come about yet. We still have a lot of families, um, men, women who have to leave their country just because they don't have opportunities back home. And this is something that Connected Women is trying to solve. So aside from 
those women who and men who leave the country to go overseas, we also have around 5 million women here in the Philippines who are out of the workforce, cited specifically because of family commitments um, or lack of job opportunities that can coexist with family commitments. And of course, in addition to this, the COVID-19 global pandemic has now affected the livelihoods of over 10.9 million Filipinos. Of course, this continues to increase. So our vision for Connected Women is to be the leading community in the Philippines for women's economic empowerment, specifically focusing on the digital economy. And we empower Filipino women, and actually we have a global community as well. So we do work with countries outside of the Philippines, um, but we look to empower women with skills and opportunities that drive the growth of the digital economy, while also providing those skills, the much needed skills that actually empower and power the digital economy as it scales up. We, um, we've, we have a very community focused organization. So we call ourselves a community led partnership powered um, strategy. And we look at how we can create opportunities for women through entrepreneurship, freelancing and remote work. And we actually have a community of over 75,000 women, the majority here in the Philippines, some um, are outside and with two strong groups in Singapore and Pakistan as well. And of course, all of the work that we do is aligned with the sustainable development goals. We have two key programs that we're focused on right now. Um, one is our 2021 program themed The Digital Economy Is Now. And this is led in partnership with Facebook She Means Business. Facebook She Means Business is a global initiative by Facebook focused on um, empowering women with skills, very much aligned to connected women's mission but really looking at how we can empower more women entrepreneurs, especially leveraging digital. And it's not just about Facebook's own platforms and tools, but we also provide different um, elements to this program, including self mastery, um, so resilience and, and coping mechanisms, especially during the pandemic, financial education. Uh, we have community forums where we bring women together to discuss challenges. We have one that's happening this evening. And then we also cover di uh, digital marketing for entrepreneurship and we have community led meetups as well, where the members themselves set up local meetups in their cities to um, to actually provide support and encouragement to each other and share skills and and tips and we've had around set over 17,000 attendees at our meetups since we launched those community led events back in 2018. And our other track is a COVID response training program specifically focused on helping those women who are underskilled or from displaced um, groups. So for example, they could be from tourism or retail and because their industry is badly affected by the pandemic, they need to upskill so that they can actually transition into other types of work. These are not the entrepreneurial type, but they are powering the entrepreneurs in the world. So what we're looking at um, in this one is what are the skills that women need in the digital economy that are relevant and in sectors that are growing. And we launched our pilot of Elevate IDA in um, mid, about this time last year with an initial 40 ladies. And we've now trained over 250 ladies in digital, in artificial intelligence um, data annotation. That's what IDA stands for. So IDA stands for artificial intelligence data annotation. And the reason why we picked this specific area is because automation, digitization, and artificial intelligence is an industry that is growing very, very fast, very, very rapidly. And it's still very much human powered. So how do machines learn? Well, they learn by, by feeding them lots and lots and lots of data. And how does the data get into the machines? Well, there's still a very big human element to that, cleaning the data, sourcing the data, and then actually keying the data in. So at the moment, this is one area that we focus on because it's a skill that anyone can learn with the most basic device, the most basic connectivity, as long as they have the passion to learn how to, how to do this skill. And the great thing about it is it's not a dead end job. It, it actually gives a lot of opportunities for moving into tracks like data science or data anal um, analytics or those types of STEM um, fields. And so these skills that we're, we're training these women in really does support the technological advancement of the whole world. So um, of course, there are segments which are very much focused on high tech AI clients that we work with are, are training these um, machine learning models. But then there are simpler um, sort of other end of the spectrum skills that are needed just keying in and, and cleaning up data and things like that. So any 
companies that are actually digitizing and automating through chatbot creation or um, anything that they need to automate in their business, they can also utilize some of these um, sort of different services, what we call micro work that we train our women in. And our, we've been fortunate to win awards for the work that we've done, the MIT Inclusive Innovation Challenge, Future of Work UK, WSIS um, in Geneva, and also the UN Women COVID Action um, Award, which happened last end of uh, last year. And we have amazing partners that support us by either funding our programs or um, providing jobs to the women who have been trained. And um, that's it. So thank you so much. And we look forward to working with you to help create opportunities and solutions for women in the future of work. Thank you so much, Gina. Definitely, I'm looking forward to parsing out some more um, about the really amazing and interesting work that, that you're doing um, in our panel discussion. So I will now turn it over to Wek. Hi, Wek. Hi. Hello, everyone. So let me just share my screen here. OK, so I just wanted to check whether the screen is already being shared. Yeah. Is it? OK, great. So, OK, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Wek de Guzman, and I'm the founder and CEO of Social Philo. So um, thank you for having me here as one of our panelists. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, so today, I will talk about our agency as well as our clients' experience during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I really believe it's not yet the aftermath of COVID pandemic. So I would really like to focus on what's been going on um, until, to now, until now. Right. So um, Social Fellow is a digital agency. We actually focus on creating strategies, producing digital content, and managing social media pages, and yeah, almost everything digital. Um, we are present in two countries. We have offices in the Philippines, um, here in Makati City, and also in Australia, Melbourne, Australia, to be specific. We are a member of the largest chambers um, uh, here in the Philippines, the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and also the Philippine LGBT Chamber of Commerce, which is the, the very first and the oldest chamber um, in Southeast Asia. And lastly, we are also a member of the Australia Philippines Business Council. Our mission um, is pretty much to be the catalyst of meaningful brand, co brand conversations across digital channels. And to enable us to, to do that, that mission, we have partnered with, um, yeah, so, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm being reminded of my other meetings. Everything has become online. So, <laughs> so we have Alexa reminding us of the meeting, the, the, the computer reminding us of the meeting. Sorry about that, but I digress. So um, to, um, to enable us to, um, fulfill our mission. We have partnered with some of the largest and most trusted uh, technology partners. We have your Digimind, which is a social listening and analytics platform. Um, they help us with getting the social sentiments of the clients of the customers. We also have Yellow Messenger. It is an artificial chatbot that enables our clients um, to set up customer help desks that um, provide um, more straight through conversations and more seamless conversations. Um, and lastly, we have Gamnet. Um, Gamnet is, is an advertising, a programmatic advertising firm. Um, they help us with, with making sure that brand awareness and reach for our clients are, are achieved. And um, throughout the three years of existence of Social Philo, we, we have actually been so fortunate to be working with the biggest and trusted local and international brands. And we were also fortunate um, to, have been, to have worked with these brands through our partnership with other creative agencies, as well as the chambers that we are a part of. And pretty much these are the industries we serve, um, pretty diverse, yep. And to enable us um, make sure that our clients are happy with our services, um, these are our team. As you can see, everybody's actually happy before the pandemic. Um, here, we have some um, team members deployed in our client offices um, here in ESPN5. They provide community management for them. But you know, um, when, when, the, when the pandemic hit, um, everything changed. Um, 
I'm not going to mention pretty much about the, our clients itself, but you know, I'll just mention the industries that were affected. First of all, um, with our retail clients, um, they deal with grocery. Um, they are a brick and mortar um, grocery agency, a grocery um, grocery brand. They were not really prepared for this pandemic, so they had to close most of their shops because they did not have any e-commerce. Um, um, set up on their end, which we help them on. We also have um, clients from the food industry. They closed down because, you know, in terms of um, the structure, they just relied on dining in. But, you know, um, eventually uh, we helped them um, cope with, 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 um, with the times and help them set up with e-commerce, also help them with online ordering and whatnot. As far as the agency is concerned, we also experienced uh, major issues. Um, the Philippines being a third world country, everything is, or not really everything, but most are being done um, in a very rather um, old fashioned way in terms of receiving payments from clients. There was a point that the agency wasn't receiving or is not able to receive payment from, from our clients for about six months, pretty much because our clients um, did not have the online funds transfer, online payment facility. Um, in the past, we actually have a messenger who would go to our clients and claim the checks for the payment for our services. But a lot of those changed. Um, and of course, if there are some delays in the cash flow, a lot of the operations is impacted. But you know, at the end of the day, um, we, we still managed to make things work out. So from being a very face-to-face -face agency, dealing with our clients face-to-face, -face, we had to resort to online means. Our agency had to go through, um, everybody worked from home. Nobody was allowed to go from work. Uh, nobody was allowed to go to work. We had three checkpoints in one day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one before the end of day, just to make sure that service delivery is, is still um, within spec and timelines. And it helped um, one way or another. At first, um, the technology infrastructure in the Philippines, it was hard because, you know, um, in terms of the speed of the internet um, last year, we really had issues with connecting with everyone. There was a um, frequent disconnection during online meetings and whatnot. And within about three to six months, um, eventually technology improved here in the Philippines and our agency, um, yep, another meeting reminder. <laughs> Yeah, our agency uh, took the initiative in, in reaching out to the frontliners here in the Philippines. So um, we, we reached out to, to people in the armed forces, in the police, in the fire department, um, everybody dealing with, um, with, with making sure that everybody's safe. And in the course of three to six months that we have been going around Metro Manila and neighboring, neighboring provinces, we have been able to uh, distribute about 5,000 food already for, for these frontliners. And if you see here, this guy at the back of our car, <laughs> through technology, um, we are still able to, to work uh, with our clients at the back of the car. So a lot has improved. So anyways, um, while there has been a lot of challenges with engagement in, within our agency, um, we were able to adapt. Uh, to the times before we had parties um, that is done face to face. Um, during Halloween, we had this virtual Halloween party where everybody dressed up <laughs> and did their thing in front of the camera, in front of the online meeting, and we also had an awarding. So, you know, um, these are the things that we did as an agency to cope with, with the times um, of digital, uh, digital issues, with the pandemic, with mental wellness. So, yeah. So, um, thank you. So, cheers to everyone. Um, we look forward to, to a better future, pretty much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Black, for sharing so much about all of the different ways that you Social Philo has had to adapt as well as your customers and clients. And I'm very much looking forward to digging a little more into that um, in our panel discussion. Sure. Um, so <laughs> next, um, we will turn over to Rachel. Um, and I will ask 
um, Janessa, if she can pull up uh, Rachel's presentation. Okay, hi. Uh, Rachel, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, hi. So thank you for the presentation uh, for me, the PPT show the screen on the screen. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Rachel. Hi. Can I just follow? Oh, okay. Okay, that's great. Hi, I'm Rachel from Kairos International Marketing Group. And I started my business from almost nothing with only 100 US dollars since 2017. And now we have more than seven, seven employees in Taipei and Shanghai office. And we have also have the warehouse in Hangzhou in China. Uh, we have our own platform, just like uh, Shijina said uh, before, uh, we have the platform at Alibaba, Taobao, and Shopee and Lazada, we have uh, a lot of platforms and we sell mother and baby goods for the retail customers. We, 70, we have 70% uh, customer from China and 30% from South Asia, such as Malaysia and Singapore and Thailand. We also have provide an e-commercial operation service for the brand cu uh, customers in Taiwan. And we also have um, helped some governmental units uh, to build up their business. And uh, here you saw a map I want to share with you. First of all, I would like to uh, briefly introduce the global cross-border e-commerce platform map here, and including some famous global main platforms and the regional online platform, because I know uh, a lot of you guys want to do the business online. Maybe it's a very small company and one person business. So I want to share this uh, information with you. Um, for the most Asian cross-borders e-commerce company, if you want our product into the Western market, we mainly focus on Amazon. This is definitely because Amazon has 300 million activity, uh, uh, active paying accounts and more than 175 e-commerce operating centers around the world is the largest one. And, uh, and also you will see the uh, Walmart and eBay's here. Walmart is the second rent e-commerce platform in the United States. And also you see eBay. eBay is the world's largest C2C platform. If you don't have a company and you just want to do some uh, C2C business, it's more than 190 countries. And you can also uh, start your business from those platform. But um, I will show another uh, platform for you because uh, all the platform I mentioned before, uh, they have a high commission fees. Uh, maybe uh, you will think this is a high cost for your business. So I will uh, start to share another platform with you. And here is a very unique situation is that um, for the large scale e-commerce platform, Western customers are willing to shop, are more willing to shop on some self-built website, which is quite different from the East. Because uh, in Asia or in the China, especially in Chinese market, because of the uh, trust issues, almost 90% of online consumption will be complete on the well-known e-commerce platform. So that's the information I want to share with you. And also you will see the Latin American, we have um, Mercado, which is the C2C platform covering 18 countries. And people said is Latin American version of Amazon, uh, uh, eBay. And also in Latin America, we have Lineo, the largest B2C platform. And it's uh, also with the business covered eight countries in Latin America. And you'll see in the center, we have Wish, the largest mobile e-commerce platform in North America and Europe, with the average daily download more than 200,000 times. This is a very nice one. And Zoom, Zoom is a fast growing mobile shopping platform. It is targeting um, the Russian and European market. And you will also see uh, on the map of in the center, you see uh, see discounts and uh, price minister in France, and also one buy in UK, auto in Germany. 
E-Prize in Italy, but there are so many series, I didn't list them all. Uh, uh, one special part I want to uh, focus on the Asia. Uh, we have the uh, Lactan in Japan and G markets in South Korea. And also Shopee, uh, I know a lot of audience from this, this, play, uh, this area, you have Shopee and Lazada. Shopee is a very fast growing platform and maybe you will know its largest shareholder is from Tenshin, China, and it covered eight sites in Southeast Asia, uh, also including Taiwan and Brazil. And you see Lazada is also one of the largest online shopping website in this area. It's covering six countries in this area. Um, they also have the Chinese uh, capitals behind, it's Alibaba. Okay, and uh, one of the special one is China, China market, Chinese market is a very unique one because uh, the online, online website like Taobao is for C2C and Timo is for B2C and it covers over 60% of my market share on the online shopping in China. So if you want to start a business from uh, to China, you maybe uh, can start from those two platforms. Uh, but in this cases, in the fields of the cross-border e-commerce, as we have shown, um, the picture, there's uh, other players sharing this market and you'll see just from the left side. Okay, and uh, uh, I would like to say, also you'll see the Taiwan, we have a lot of uh, different uh, channels here. I want to share one um, information with you about the Chinese market, because we all know the Chinese market is very tempting one and it has three uh, very unique things I want to share with you is the China, if you ha, uh, want to start a business with them, it's very high precipita. And this market is special because it's high acceptance of the foreigner uh, products. And it also have the mature e-commerce ecosystem. So um, maybe you would do some business to draw from this. And one information is about the mainland China, its online shoppers uh, reached 639 million. It's a total population of the twice of the United States and is 27 times of the total uh, populations of Taiwan. It's a really um, amazing data I want to uh, share with you. And their average consumption online is close to 2,000 US Dollar. 2000 US dollars is pretty high. And the average purchase are 62 times. The data is also from 2017 data. So uh, recently it will be more higher. But uh, if you want to get into this market, there will be have some challenge you want to, you have to conquer or you have to face it with it because this is a very big market. You have to compete with the world brands for quality, cost effectiveness and product specialty. And of course the language will be another problem. And if we have more time, I, I can also make the comparison with you uh, from the Amazon, eBay. And if you are going to doing the business with uh, Taobao, uh, they have a different feeds and cost uh, from the fl uh, payment flow or some uh, entrance cost you may want to know. Okay, and what is worth the mention here is um, Lazada, Shopee, uh, there's behind the Chinese capitals here. So if you list up your products on Taobao or Timo, and also be your BD excellent seller, your product will be automatically recommend to the Lazada platform. Both of them, your goods can also be sold at the same time to six or to eight countries as long as you ship your goods to the warehouse in mainland China. Okay, this is the information I want to share with you. 
And also we'll go back to the market uh, I didn't uh, share not yet is uh, is a Taiwanese market. If, if you want to go to the market, uh, PC Hall, Momo, and they are all B2C platform and Shopee, Lock10 uh, will be for C2C. And there's was also Taobao Taiwan, but they're just withdraw from Taiwan market this year because it could not be Shopee. And also in Africa, we have Jumia and Kilimo. Okay, so that's the whole picture of this uh, global map. I hope it, it will be helpful for your uh, future business. And uh, for the next uh, PPT, please. Uh, I want to uh, introduce some uh, supply chain about the time in Taiwan. If you cannot place the large order or you're hating low quality products from China and tying off purchasing from Alibaba, you can um, refer to Taiwan Trade. This is the website I want to show you. Um, Taiwanese supply chain is good at the products of high precision electronic parts. And you can also order some makeup and beauty products with highly professional biotechnology. And some products with special functions such as um, waterproof, fibrates, and sunscreen closing and sunglasses, et cetera, something you can see. And of course, Taiwanese food, snacks and beverage, such as tea or pineapple cake, bubble tea powder, something. Um, those products are very different uh, from the other supply chain. That's what I want to recommend with you. And next PPT will be, um, uh, I'm talking about, there's are some uh, comparisons of the online social media. If you want to promote your cross-border products uh, to, to uh, this area. The Chinese market is a very special one than other media channels. So uh, we have to familiar with it and they have a different uh, equal comparison here. And this information is for you if you consider to enter this market in the future. And we also have uh, uh, several PPTs behind. Uh, it's our company's is business cases at the back of this presentation, and I would save our time. And we do a lot of um, uh, things for the customers. And you can also ask this presentation from CIPE if you need those case study. Okay, thank you. Rachel, thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. Um, there are so many insights into the various, just the, the breadth of e-commerce platforms around the world. Um, and I, and also I, I, your journey as an entrepreneur is fascinating too. So I hope that we get a chance to dig more deeper into that, both your journey as well as sort of the pros and cons of these different platforms and, and what it's like for an entrepreneur as they're um, looking at the field. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so now we will turn to Zakir, our last panelist for his presentation. Zakir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can we have the uh, share screen here? Uh, oh, no. oh. Oh. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Uh, uh, share screen. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you see the, the presentations? All right? Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, good evenings, and good day, everyone. Uh, Thank you for the uh, opportunities. Uh, my name is uh, Zakir Mahmoud. Uh, I'm the director of the SME Center or UKM Center uh, in the University of Indonesia. So uh, as we know already that uh, 
uh, MSME is the lifeblood of the Indonesian economy because it contributed, uh, you know, around 61% of the GDP, 97% uh, of the employment, and 99.9% uh, .9 of the total establishments in the country. So from this uh, picture here, from these pyramids, you can see that uh, MSME dominates the business landscape and micro is the most dominant one. The reason why I uh, share this because our center uh, mostly uh, work with this group, uh, this micro and small uh, uh, enterprise. So that is the reason why we need to uh, learn their characteristics in order to 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 expose them to to expose them with the technology because this is the the most uh, uh, difficult part so as you can see here the major characteristics uh, of the micro micro business is usually they produce and trade the consumer goods uh, mostly in clothing uh, culinary product uh, food and beverages and and crafts uh, they do it uh, uh, day, on daily basis, um, conventional transactions using cash and physical contact, uh, informal business status, family business, and the owner's profile is just like they have like a very uh, traditional mindsets, low educations. Uh, Here. The, basically, these are the uh, uh, ma major characteristics of micro business. So can uh, you probably. Oh, could Sorry? um, we're just. Would you be able to make your presentation full screen? Just. Um... Oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. Sorry, sorry. Perfect. Yep. No, thank you so yeah. much. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, this is the impact of COVID. So I don't want to talk about this. Everybody already knows. So I will skip. Uh, this is also the the survey. Uh, we I'll show you the we conduct the survey a little a survey about the impact of this. So I just to compare, uh, but uh, I'm not going to talk uh, more about this. Uh, here, I'm, I'm trying to uh, when we uh, when we introduce technology or uh, uh, digital to this group, we have main challenge here. First, digital mindsets. Many of them uh, haven't have uh, haven't got the proper mindset in order or the need or the motivations to go digital they are in the in the uh, comfort zone right uh, and then even if they want to uh, even if they have the mindsets they are constrained with the digital literacy their knowledge how uh, what to do it how to do it uh, that is the, the main problem for them uh, and then uh, adoptions as well it's an issues uh, even if they they already have the mindset that they have already the, the literacy. They also have a problems with device, right? Because technology is changing very fast. And most of them, uh, especially living in the uh, remote area or in the uh, rural area, they have an obsolete device. You know, uh, when we are talking about uh, 5G's technology or entering 6G's technology, they only have a 2G technology, the mobile phone. So this is a, a challenge for me, for, for our centers. And not to mention that Indonesia is a very uh, large archipelago. So we have uh, infrastructures, uh, network infrastructures is not equal. We can find a good infrastructures in the urban areas, but not in the rural areas or the remote area. And the last one is the, uh, uh, we have already the digital ecosystem, but it's not connected yet. It's not uh, well connected yet. So here are the challenges uh, when we face, when we try to introduce uh, technology and, and uh, digital things to, to them, to the micro groups uh, of the uh, micro scale business in Indonesia. So in order to tackle this challenge, uh, the relevant parties uh, who can support to uh, to change these transformations, I think we have a quadruple helix, which which consists the academics, uh, business, uh, government, and community, and 
everyone has its own roles, right? Uh, everyone has its own role, but they have to do it together. Not just this is not just work alone. We cannot rely on the government. We cannot rely on the business. We cannot rely on the community. It has to be worked together between these uh, relevant parties. So um, our center, uh, it's it's part of the academics element here. So this is a uh, OKM center or SME center. So we were established in 2005. So at least we have like uh, 15 years uh, more experience. Uh, we focus only. Uh, we focus primarily on the MSME empowerment and development of entrepreneurships. Uh, uh, we provide integrated services. Uh, I will explain that later. Uh, and we try to to bridge the gap of the issues because we found that uh, sometimes a uh, policy in the government level to promote technology or digital creates some huge gaps on the ground with, with the grassroots people in the micro business. So that's why we try to bridge this gap or we try to connect the dots between uh, parties here, uh, uh, relevant parties in order to to create a more a conducive environment for this micro business group to learn technology or or to go digital. Uh, this, how do we empower uh, MSMEs and develop the 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 by conducting these three activities? So as you mentioned, it's just like Gina already, you know, have a capacity building, trainings, mentoring, uh, coaching, uh, those kind of things. Uh, and then, but we also do research on that. A research, for instance, on how these groups uh, adopt technology, what factors determine uh, their, uh, their, uh, their willingness to adopt or technology acceptance model, uh, not only research, we also conduct the business advocacy. So basically, uh, this one, this this activity is uh, uh, is just like a CSR of our center, you know, like a business gathering, business clinics. So, how do we achieve this? We work together with that uh, the relevant parties, you know, the governments. We conduct research with the governments. For instance, we help the central banks. Uh, in order to to uh, uh, learn about what factors determining the, the adoptions of financial technology for them, uh, something like that. And then on the capacity building, also we conduct digital training, uh, digital marketing, uh, uh, digital financing, everything. Uh, also uh, in the uh, advocacy business. So the pandemic uh, has already mentioned that change the the context here so we used to do it offline you know you know face to face but now we have to do it digitally we use a, a zoom meeting or or google meetings everything that makes we need to to innovate and uh, and uh, be creative because during the training we cannot ask them to sit in front of the screen from nine to five, right? It, it will be boring for them. So that's why we need to, to be creative and innovative in delivering our uh, materials to them. The same thing also for research. We used we use to, uh, to conduct a survey, but we cannot do it right now because uh, you know the lockdown, because of the social distancing issues. So that's why we need to or how do we do this, uh, this research if we have a questionnaire? So we try to uh, impose, uh, we use the uh, digital, for instance, like a Google form questionnaires and everything. And then uh, we get the response from there, uh, that kind of things. Uh, the things also, same thing also for the uh, advocacy. So we provide, uh, you know, sharing sessions between, between the micro business in an IG talk series, we, we call it, we have an IG talk series. So basically they, they share their business in order to give, to, to be inspired for, to, to, to be an inspiration for others, uh, sharing sessions and business clinics. Uh, 
yeah, we work together with the government, with the business, and also with the communities. Uh, I think that's all my presentations, and then we will look forward for the discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fakir. Um, I, I loved that slide about the digital ecosystem um, because that's something that SIPE really looks at as well in terms of strengthening and creating a really strong enabling environment for micro, small, medium enterprises to grow. And then your point uh, about sort of the implementation gap between policies that exist on books and how that translates down and how you know, we can better educate you know, micro, small, medium enterprises about the digital economy landscape is well noted. Um, and my colleague will be sharing a little bit more about some of our digital economy resources as well. Um, with that, I would love to get started on our panel discussion. And just a reminder to all of our participants, please feel free to use the Q&A box and start sending in your questions. Um, we, there is so much to dig into and so many interesting pieces to this, so we'll do our best to get to it. But for now, I'll go ahead and get started with um, our first question, which is to Ms. Gina. Um, Gina, just as a follow-up to your presentation, um, you mentioned a lot about sort of, you know, that there are, five, I think you said, five million women in the Philippines that are out of the workforce, which is a huge, huge number. And we know that COVID-19 has really exacerbated these existing inequalities in the workforce, as well as the digital gender divide. So I am wondering if you could dig a little more deeper into some of the unique challenges that women in the Philippines face, in particular women entrepreneurs and women in the business, and then how have you seen their businesses adapt as a result? Sure, so, um, well, I think, the first question I probably need to start with is, is why do we focus on women? Because people ask us that all the time, you know, why are you only helping women? And I think, you know, for those who are less familiar with the women's empowerment space, there are so many indicators that, you know, equality is nowhere near, um, even the needle isn't even really moving and it's gone backwards now because of COVID. So, you know, women have, are less likely to have access to financial institutions like a bank account. Um, of the 3.9 billion people who are offline across the whole world um, in remote or poorer or less educated areas, it tends to be women and girls who are most impacted. And women are less likely to be entrepreneurs because they face um, other disadvantages in starting a business. They're also um, constrained from the highest leadership positions. So for example, only 5% of Fortune 500 um, companies have CEO, women CEOs. So, so there are so many challenges already in this space. Um, and then when you take it right down to the grassroots, when we first came back to the Philippines and we ran some surveys, you know, this, the question was simple. What are the biggest challenges that you have in your career or, or, you know, having a career or a business? And the top three reasons were location to available work opportunities, lack of decent work opportunities and family responsibilities. Um, so, you know, I don't think that these challenges are very specific to the Philippines. I know that, for example, in the US alone, 43% of women drop out of the workforce after they have kids. So that's already, that already points to a lot, a lot of talent draining out of the workforce. Um, so what we focus on is one, entrepreneurship is really um, an opportunity to have more flexibility, <laughs> flexibility for those entrepreneurs, you'll know why I did this, um, you know, flexibility to work and, and run your family and you have more control over your hours and how, how, drip, how much drive you put into your work versus your family. Um, and the other side of the coin is really technology is such a game changer, not just for entrepreneurship because the barrier for entry is so low now, um, and I think Rachel really demonstrated that very well in, in terms of all of the opportunities globally in terms of e-commerce, but really looking at, you know, what are the other opportunities that women can actually tap into in this digital economy? And it's really actually quite simple, you know, for women, giving them access to technology means that they have location independence, so they can work from anywhere or in many places. Um, it gives them more flexibility to, to juggle and manage the other responsibilities that they have in their life. Um, and it means that they don't have to choose between a career and a family and put one or the other off, or um, even you know just access opportunities to earn, which is so important in terms of financial independence. And, and, you know, and even if you think about 
um, safety and security of women, if they have access to be able to earn and save their own money, then it gives them a lot more freedom um, to, for example, mobilize outside of abusive relationships. So there's, there are so many areas and um, te technology is the one area that Connected Women is focusing on because it's something that I've personally experienced as an empowering tool. Um, and we feel that that's something that can at least um, get, you know, get things moving in the right direction. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, our ne my next question is for WEC. Um, WEC Social Philo is really directly engaged in um, helping businesses go digital essentially. So I am curious, um, what trends or patterns have you observed of SME successes? And um, at least since the start of the pandemic. And then um, at part two of my question is, how has the pandemic influenced the types of uh, services that your customers uh, need most? Sure. Thanks for that, Surajana. Yeah, um, we are actually very fortunate to be to have handled um, SFD businesses through our clients, and you know we must remember that when the pandemic hit, actually the Philippines um, was, was hit very badly. About 60% of the small businesses here in the Philippines um, shut down. Um, if you go to malls, if you go to simple marketplaces, um, the, the physical marketplaces, everything closed. So um, there was massive unemployment and there was also massive hunger. And, you know, um, the one of the main barriers that SMEs or, um, yeah, SMEs um, were encountering is that they were really not prepared to go digital because um, most of the establishments, um, the, the mom and pop stores, um, really rely on foot traffic. So a lot of the restaurants closed down, um, a lot of the small eateries closed down. And, you know, um, through the social media um, pages that we handle, we provided some information campaigns on how they can um, go digital. Um, we provided some information about e-commerce. We provided options for, for payment options. And at the latter part of the year last year, we actually started um, running um, these webinars called Negosha Webinar. Negosha in the Philippines is business. Um, so it's a business webinar. The objective of the business webinar is pretty much to encourage um, entrepreneurs um, or at least aspiring entrepreneurs to really go start their businesses. Um, here in the Philippines, there's really um, a massive lack of information dissemination um, about um, creating your own business, and there's also not much government support. If there is government support, um, information dissemination about that is not distributed as effectively as it should be. So um, um, Zach here mentioned about low education of the digital mindset, attitude, knowledge, and all those are actually um, um, are the same here in the Philippines. So through the Negosho webinar series that we um, that we that we held, um, it actually um, encouraged a lot of potential entrepreneurs to start their businesses. So we receive a lot of queries. We receive a lot of um, yeah. We receive a lot of queries about how to start their business. Um, how much does it uh, does it uh, does it cost to start a business? And um, if say for example you don't have money to start business, how can you do it? Um, because you know at the end of the day, starting a business, the very first barrier in starting a business is funding. Um, in most cases. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, it's really more on very um, massive information dissemination. Now you mentioned about um, what 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 trends, uh, what are the actual successes? So um, I mentioned about the um, e-commerce. Um, in terms of e-commerce, we help them set up um, e-commerce um, their e-commerce websites, um, e-commerce within Facebook, and uh, we also um, socialize them to various payment platforms, um, in making sure that there is flexibility on how they pay. Um, here in the Philippines, there's a, a, a huge gap between um, Filipinos who who have bank accounts and who don't have bank 
accounts. And that in itself is already a plot problem in e-commerce. So um, we are fortunate that there are some telcos who were able to um, come up with, with online wallets um, in, their, in their services. So that helped a lot. Um, an example of which is Gcash, um, another is PayMaya and, and, and some sort. And also um, banks were able to, to quickly adapt to, to, to the times um, in going full digital. There is actually this bank um, here in the Philippines, ING. They are very successful in, in going full digital um, in, in being able to support small businesses and you know having the freedom to, to live their lives, so to speak. Um, and there's also um, this issue about technological preparedness. Um, in the Philippines, you know, people just 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 go about their daily lives, go to the office and and whatnot. And you know, um, in terms of entrepreneurship, um, they, they, they don't have that mindset. Um, people here in the Philippines mostly just want to work and earn a living and then go home to their families to provide. So that's it. Thank you so much, Wex. Yeah, the, the lack of information dissemination um, and just sort of general education and targeted support programs is it seems to be a common thread. And I know that Gina and her through Connected Women, they also offer similar trainings and webinars um, and Zakir mentioned this as well. So um, that's really, really heartwarming to see that that's being addressed. Um, I wanna now turn to uh, Rachel um, a little bit of a different question, but I'm in, in a similar way, I'm curious um, how the pandemic affected your business in particular, and uh, as well as if you could speak to, you know, how it affected, you know, other digital entrepreneurs, um, and I'm curious how you adapted as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to share with you is that in the previous year, our revenue mainly from the niche products with much higher unit price, about like US dollars, uh, 50 to 100 US dollars. But after COVID, um, the customers are not willing to pay such a high price to obtain some, some products like, like this. Um, so they preferred to purchase the affordable products were necessary. That's a trend I, I, I want to uh, share with you. And so this year we spend a lot of time on maintaining our old customer and expand our low and media price product line. And I, I want to encourage uh, the audience, maybe you your company have the um, low, low, low Law or media price product, but with high quality, and the Chinese market, Taiwan and the South Asia would be a good uh, market for you if you can use the uh, correct tool for uh, for online, and you will find your way to uh, for your small business. So um, after COVID, we uh, have a lot of problems on the product, but we keep our treat our old customer well, and we're providing the affordable uh, products to maintain our revenue. Uh, we use a lot of like sales bundle or some customer relationship management way to uh, make our old customer to pick up more items from our website. This matters um, because in the in the past, we we may be focused on how to getting the highest profits from it. But um, this measure after COVID, we are trying to uh, to reduce our advertising expense a lot uh, to to keep our cash more to maintain our company. This is a key way where we are trying to survive uh, right now. So I think marketing to the old customer is very important. If you have your own business way, you can obtain extremely low cost traffic from it and just treat your old customer well and meet their needs as much as possible. Um, it will just save your company's life in an extreme times like COVID-19. Um, another thing I want to share with you is um, at the same time, ap uh, after COVID-19 is all, so that us to pay attention to the importance of the local supply chain. Um, in the past, the Asia customer may have preferred international brands more, 
Um, however, after COVID, uh, a lot of consumer was uh, also, they will still trust the international brands, but they will pay more attention to whether the products properly disinfected and is it produced from the uh, epidemic area? Is it safe for them? Is They will prefer the local uh, brands, uh, the domestic produced products. So if we can keep our um, products inventory supply stable, and luckily, luckily uh, the Taiwan epidemic prevention work is doing well and the customers just feel safe to buy our products. And we currently also have the warehouse. We have the enough inventories in Taipei and Hangzhou and the production all comes from the local area. So we are, we are focused on the local supply chain and that will um, just make sure our stability of our business. So that's how I want to um, answer your question, I hope. Thanks so much, Rachel, for digging more deeply into sort of the specific ways that you, you know, chose to um, change your business model to adapt. Uh, appreciate hearing about that. Um, I'm going to wrap up our first round with my um, last question to Zakir. So uh, what are some examples of SME's entrepreneurial resiliency during the pandemic? And from an academic standpoint, I'm curious what works in terms of really nurturing digital entrepreneurs and these entrepreneurial systems? You're muted, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, can, can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, as you know that the, the pandemic uh, uh, disrupt the uh, supply chain uh, between uh, SME and uh, customers and SME and their suppliers, right? That is the reasons why uh, we need to go digital in order to restore the connection, right? So yeah, uh, during this pandemic, uh, the, the thing is yeah, they have to adapt with the situations right now. And uh, in order to survive, they need to transform their business. They have to modify their business uh, or you call it innovations or everything. Uh, a simple things that we, we found that uh, uh, many of them right now switch their marketing from offline to online. They use Facebook, uh, a simple one, the free one, uh, the IG, uh, Instagrams, or they marketing their products through TikTok right now. So many of them uh, try to to switch. Th this is the good thing, right? So it's part of the resiliency uh, in order to be to survive there. Or, uh, for instance, they also uh, modified their products. Uh, before they produce t-shirts, now they switch to making a mask, uh, uh, you know, the, the mask, uh, something like that. Uh, it's, it's part of, or uh, they, because of the, the issues of uh, 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 payment systems, or now they try to relax the payment system, for instance. Uh, they, they accept the digital or they, they receive like several installments uh, for, for their customers or for their supply, uh, uh, for their customers in order to, to, uh, to survive the business. Other things is they, uh, some of them try to, to, uh, change to modify their business model a bit. It means like, for instance, uh, now they collaborate with their customers or their suppliers in order to provide something. So these, these are some, some examples, examples, real examples of uh, entrepreneurial resil resiliency during the pandemic. Uh, about the second one, uh, what needs to be done or works in order to nurture uh, digital entrepreneurs and digital entrepreneurs ecosystems? I think uh, once again, because uh, we are working with the in the group business group from the at the very bottom of the pyramids, so their issues, their main issues is the mindset. They don't want uh, their mindset. So it's it's uh, what we need right now is they have a must have a proper mindset to go digital. They have to find the the need 
the, we have to 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 encourage them to 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 have a need you have to go digital this is for your own sake for your business otherwise you you die something like that this is very hard for us in order to to change these mindsets and uh, uh, once again uh, literacy as well in terms of their knowledge their uh, attitudes and their practice uh, we found a lot of uh, interesting findings here for instance like uh, we conduct a digital marketing training uh, using facebook for instance and then uh, after months we met again we asked uh, so how's your sales right now no nothing happens and then we we knew that they open their Facebook once a week. Uh, this this is issues, right? If there is no response from uh, quick response from the seller, nobody wants to buy from you again, right? This kind of thing is very simple, uh, but uh, they need to be empowered on this area. That is the reason sometimes we ask them, okay, please bring your son or your daughter to come to the. Uh, to the uh, the training because your son or your daughter is more digital savvy there, right? Uh, <laughs> this is very very uh, simple things uh, ha uh, happening in, in the real life. Uh, besides this, uh, besides the literacy and uh, once again a network, but this is governments, right? This is government. Government has to provide the adequate uh, infrastructures. Uh, uh, infrastructures and, and, and source device and regulations. Regulation is, is, is also uh, digital regulations about uh, cyber security, privacy, quality of services for the infrastructures. Uh, uh, I, th th this is, I think, this is the, the important uh, aspects needs to be available in order to nurture the digital entrepreneurs and, and uh, ecosystems. Uh, I hope it answered the questions. Thank you. No, that was great. Thank you so much for providing such a comprehensive view of sort of what needs to be in place um, in these digital um, ecosystems. So I want to make sure that we have enough time for Q&A. So my second round of questions, I'm gonna ask you all to be very quick and short in your responses, and then we will get to the good part, the Q&A for which um, we've got some good questions from our participants already. So. For our, our last round of questions, just for the panel discussion, um, I'll start off with Ms. Gina again. Um, Gina, you already talked a little bit about sort of the programs that um, Connected Women offers, um, especially to prepare them for sort of a post-COVID uh, digital world, but feel free to add sort of any other takeaways you'd love. And then my, my question here is what support systems um, do you see are needed uh, for women entrepreneurs and MSMEs to be able to sustain and grow their businesses? Um, and feel free to just add any last takeaways as well. Sure, thanks so much. So, um, well, so many of the challenges that were very well articulated by Zakir are so relatable to us here in the Philippines, I think. We face very similar issues in terms of the digital transformation roadblocks. Um, I think another side of that is also the education of the consumers as well, right? So, you know, changing the mindset of the consumers so they can really maximize their participation in the digital economy and support the local entrepreneurs. I think that, um, you know, supporting local entrepreneurs is something that we've seen very, um, very prevalent during the COVID um, pandemic. One, because of just difficulty with logistics, but also because people suddenly realize that if they don't support their local um, you know, buyers and uh, their local sellers and, and organizations, then they're gonna really lose them. And then what will be left? We see businesses shutting down everywhere, I think, right? So our experience at Connected Women is re and our strength is very much on that community building. So we, we have a strong consumer advocacy component in everything that we do. Um, and having this sort of commu community led partnership driven approach means that we can reach women from all over the country and then convert them into advocates for the type of things that we're trying to do so that they can actually support each other through the skill sharing and knowledge sharing and i really think that community building is something that is very essential and that a lot of organizations are now starting to lean into um, and of course working with partners like facebook where they provide us with the 
the knowledge, the, I mean, they've rolled this program out across 38 markets, over a million women have been through it. So they understand um, what content, what the challenges, they've done all that research. So that enables us to focus on what we do best, which is really disseminating that information, advocating, implementing the programs, and of course, creating that very important support network for the women. Thank you so much, Gina. I love the um, point on advocacy, and I, there is a really great question in the Q&A that we'll get to later that I might pivot to you. Um, Rachel, I, um, or sorry, Beck, <laughs> um, you, you touched upon this a little bit, but um, any final takeaways in terms of what you see as um, necessary tools or skills or technologies that you recommend for your clients, your customers, or future entrepreneurs as they adapt and try and compete in this marketplace. Thanks. So yeah, um, initially people were, were so reliant on, on the government um, to save them um, from hunger, from, from lack of, of livelihood and whatnot, until several months um, in the pandemic, people started venturing into social people started creating content in, in YouTube. And, <laughs> and you won't imagine how crazy it is that there's an influx of content produced in TikTok and, and YouTube, um, sharing best practices about online work um, and in terms of how to upskill them, how to price their, um, their products and, and services. But to be specific, um, the, the the, one of the best ways to learn how to go about your social media management, how to go about advertising properly on Facebook is through Facebook Blueprint. Um, also within Facebook, uh, there's a lot of Facebook groups that share best practices. Um, Regard uh, uh, this uh, with whatever topic that you want to that you want to discuss, be it online selling be it social media management, be it um, how to uh, formulate strategies and whatnot. And at some point, um, the, the, the influx also of freelancers doing social media management somewhat affected our business. <laughs> Because um, Social Fellow does a lot of social media management. At, and at some point, some of our potential clients were already telling us that, oh, you know what, what? Um, we have a, 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 a group of freelancers giving us the same set of services that you are proposing right now, but at a cheaper rate. I mean, oh my God, you're starting to command the price. <laughs> but, you know, it's great um, for them, of course. Um, not too great for us, but it actually um, calls us to, be, to pivot into something, um, something more, um, something more robust in terms of, of a high level technical expertise. So yeah, um, we also have their Skillshare. Of course, we, we always promote the use of Skillshare um, and also Upwork for them to make sure that they will be able to join the online, um, online, um, online community for, for virtual assistants and like that. So yeah. Thank you so much, Wek. Rachel, um, kind of a similar question to you. Uh, what advice would you give sort of other entrepreneurs that want to enter the digital economy and are looking into cross-border e-commerce platforms? Go ahead, Rachel. Oh, hi. Um, uh, I, I want to uh, answer this question. It's about um, as an entrepreneur, as the, especially your leaders in your company, you have to um, change your mindset because uh, a lot of panelists that uh, talk about the uh, digital transformation. And that is the words I think is transformed uh, mainly from your mindset. That is the most important. You have to keep the pace of your industry. You know, uh, the uh, you absorb information as much as possible, especially uh, being the leader. You have to educate your employees, and you have to know that your a lot of coworkers. Uh, with your office to know your mind and you you, you have to trans, um, translate those information for them so the mindset is very important because you have the right correct mindset and you will just not close your eyes and you will see the really opportunity where the, the opportunity is this is quite important uh, also in this part I want to um, talk about the 
one person e-commerce because I, I know a lot of audience they want to start a business maybe from just one person and um, I think this times provide us a very uh, nice environment and circumstances we have a lot of tools like uh, I just mentioned before the a self built uh, platform you can make maybe make your own platform by Shopify and you can also use some tours from Alibaba. Uh, you're 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 doing AliExpress using those tools because they have a very uh, complete uh, ecosystem uh, for the e-commerce business. So this is uh, quite important. You know how you you know how to use those tools, and you 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 have the skills to doing your own business. So I think the enterprise uh, can be small. But strong, and in these times, we have um, opportunity to do the low capital personal business. This is very important because after COVID, um, we have um, a lot of just like other panelists as said before, a lot of company they they just shut down, and you have to keep your company small with low cost so you can survive after this extreme time. If you keep your, your cost low and you can survive more time than the giant company, because we know um, in this COVID, a lot of even giant company, they just shut down, uh, not just small and medium company. So you have to keep your cost low and uh, flexibility, and you can also um, to go for a long way. Um, here, I want to share with you about one um, philosophy, something is from the art of war. It's Sun Zi Pingfa. It's in this times, uh, we are not just, um, maybe in the past time, we are trying to kill our competitors or compete with each other. Um, that's, I don't think it's suitable for this time. Uh, in this time, we have to do is try to um, survive together. And we are trying to avoid competition with each other. We can find our specialty with the small business, but you're just focused on a small group of people. And you just focus on the small group of people and meet their needs. There's a rules about uh, uh, 10,000 uh, people rules. If you're getting 10,000 people in your business, they are continually buying the stuff and your products continually, and you will get your business uh, survive. And I think this is a good example for we are during this COVID-19 thing. And uh, you can think more about you can survive with your competitor together and not just kill them. That's why Sun Zivinfa said, not be defeated is the victory. So you're, you're, you're just uh, get your, your personally not be defeated with low cost, with your creativity, with your specialty of your business and you will be not be defeated and you don't need to kill anybody. So I think this is the, the thing and the best part I really like this time. Thank you. Thanks so, thanks so much, Rachel. That's a great um, sort of empowering and inspiring message. Um, I am want to open up the Q&A. Um, so here, there's the question I had for you is kind of similar to some of the ones um, that our participants have been um, inserting in. So I might try and combine a couple just for uh, to conserve some time. So we've got a question on how SMEs can be brought into dialogue and advocacy more. So how can individual business owners connect their issues with, um, or their issues or barriers to the larger systemic problems in the ecosystem? And similarly, um, if you can also talk about, you know, what are the regulations that can best facilitate SMEs to uh, enter the supply chain or to be more prepared for supply chain opportunities? So um, Gina and Gina and uh, Zakir, if you'd like to go ahead and answer this one. Oh, shall I go first? <laughs> um, so, um, okay, so I'll just speak from a personal perspective in terms of how can we, 
you know, how can SMEs get more involved in the conversation? So Connected Women is extremely vocal. <laughs> We're small, um, but we don't, we don't go away. So uh, we've been very persistent in consistently reaching out to mm -hmm. government agencies, to different um, organizations, anyone who will listen to us, basically. We want to talk to them about the challenges that we, we see in our community and, and our perceived solutions and the support that we need. So I think, you know, there is, there is a tendency for, for entrepreneurs, and I do this as well, right, to sit in our own circles and complain about the things that are not happening. Um, but actually, one of the things that I realized at some point in my life is I just have to get up and, and, and step up and lead it sometimes, even though I don't really want to be a leader, to be honest. Um, but I put myself out there because someone has to get it started, right? So that's one thing. And I think um, from the perspective of challenges, I just want to raise something that's really something that we've come across as a massive challenge is that the clients and the partners that we work with believe they work with us because they believe in our mission, which is to create this sustainable um, business model where we create opportunities for women while also helping businesses thrive in the digital economy. Now, a lot of people are surprised because we're not a not for profit. We're actually a for profit social impact business. And that gets very little recognition. It's hard for um, organizations to reconcile that you can actually be a for profit business that commits to doing social good like consistently as part of everything that you do every day. And so I would like to see more support um, in the region from, from agencies that really support social enterprises and help educate um, partners, clients, and funding bodies about this um, very, you know, kind of relatively new business model that I think is effective and sustainable in the long term. So I, sadly in the region, compared to other parts of the world, there seems to be little recognition for for-profit social impact businesses. So I'd love to see more discussions about that. Uh, is it, is it my, my turn, is it? <laughs> yes, please. Okay, yeah. So uh, adding to that, to, to what has already been uh, said by uh, Gina, yeah, I, I agree 100% that uh, first, you already mentioned, in order to put them into uh, in the conversations, uh, we have to uh, 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 equip them with, with some uh, knowledge, right? Some, some knowledge and how to, to play this game. Because this, this, uh, this technology or digital, uh, it's a different, different platforms, uh, different, different playgrounds. So you have to be prepared uh, in this. So that is the reason why uh, we try to, uh, as a as a center here, to to equip them with with the, with the knowledge, with with the uh, uh, through the training, uh, mentoring, and coaching. But we also try, uh, as Gina already said, not only from the supply side but the demand side as well. So we try to connect with the uh, with the governments or the uh, the business in order to provide like a, a partnerships and everything in order to, to, uh, to create demand for the products. Or for instance, the agency governments, uh, right now they have a, a policy, uh, a government procurement for a certain amount uh, should be uh, for only for MSMEs, uh, not, not the large scale. So these kind of affirmative uh, policies from the government in terms of the regulations. Uh, and then there's also, uh, regulations that to support the uh, the local brands or or uh, buy locals uh, same thing uh, like this it also create a uh, demand uh, for for the product so hopefully we, we're not just helping them from the supply side but also uh, creating demand for the products as well uh, and 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 for that we need not only government we need business we need community and everything that's why the, the quadruple helix uh, is is very important in this sense. Thank you so much, Gina and Zakir. Um, I know we're almost running out of time, so I'm going to wrap up with one final question for you, Weck and Rachel, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Ryan for our closing remarks. So um, it's a two part question. So. Rachel, this question for you is, um, you mentioned a lot about sort of different e-commerce platform tools to promote your product. So in your experience, which e-commerce platform do you think is maybe, which which are um, maybe, which platforms would you recommend, for example, to promote products online? And then uh, the last, the second part of the question 
um, whack for you is uh, kind of, again, on the topic of resiliency, are there other elements of resiliency that you think SMEs um, need to have access to? So for example, flexible, flexible credit terms, licensing, customs policies, digital taxation, um, et cetera. Uh, who's going first? <laughs> Is it me? <laughs> so okay, right. sure. Well, sure. Right. Go. <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually great that you mentioned about digital taxation because, um, um, yeah, even my agency, um, I still consider us as a, a small um, agency. Uh, we still have issues with digital taxation um, for the ads that we run in Facebook. Um, we're actually being taxed for the entire month. Of the, of the ads that we're um, running for Facebook when um, there is actually just a small percentage of that um, from our revenue. So say for example, it's it's 100,000 um, um, boosting and then 20% of that is ours. Um, instead of just being taxed for the 20%, we are being taxed for the entire thing. So, <laughs> so yeah, definitely in terms of government taxation, making sure that everything is, is taxed properly would be so great. Um, next is, um, sorry, which, what, what part? I, I forgot the, the other part. Sorry. <laughs> I got so many. Right. <laughs> no, of course, just in general, if there are any other um, sort of elements that you think are necessary, it could be like credit term, flexible credit terms, yeah. licensing, Correct. customs policies. Correct. So yeah, um, in terms of government support, um, I think the Department of Trade and Industries, DTI, um, which which is which actually governs the small businesses and sole proprietors. Uh, it would be great if there will be some some sort of government funding to help you get started um, in terms of training in a form perhaps of coupons on Skillshare, um, coupons on, on 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 learning platforms. You know, just to get you started on on whatever business that you you would want. That would be great. Also, I think um, information dissemination would would also do um, do good. Um, um, because, you know, there's a lot of fake news. Um, yeah, I, I hope the government will, will put more effort in, in, in their um, efforts in dis disseminating proper information about creating businesses and what the government can do for them. I believe there's also support from the OSD, from the Department of Science and Technology. Um, I hope they can also um, give more support to, to, to um, budding entrepreneurs um, and also to established entrepreneurs. Because you know, even if you're already an established entrepreneur, if the, the pandemic um, hit your business badly, what will you do? <laughs> so it would be nice that there will still be um, support, not just for starting entrepreneurs, but also for more established entrepreneurs. Thank you so much, Wack. Rachel, the last question is for you. Um, okay. One of our participants. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, the question is about how to choose the right platform for for your, yes. your or your company. And I, um, sorry. And I think first of all, you need to understand your customer because you have to choose a, a group of customer you really want to do and you understand them correctly. Um, uh, and you can have a lot of uh, insights from this kind of group of people. Uh, second is to combine with your passion and skills. Uh, for example, I'm a mother. I know uh, my customers uh, is all from old mother and baby, and I know them well. And they're they're they have a children, and when they will buy my products and who they are, and I know them well. And this is also my past passions here. So uh, why I mentioned the second one is but passions very important because uh, from the startup business, you may not to earn a lot of money and you may lose money. But if you find your passion and you know, you will still feel happy even you're losing money. So I think the second one is very important. It's about the passion. Of course, you have to combine your skills and resource, uh, what kinds of product you have and what kind of manufacturing uh, you you getting your product lines and that is quite important. But I think the passionate is very important. And about the platform, I also want to share some information about the cost of choosing the uh, the platform because for the 
e-commerce cross-border business, you have to care about four things. One is the information flows, uh, which means uh, where do you put your information or where you got your data from your business. The information flow is very important. And the second part would be the product flow. The product flow is I just talk, mentioned about where did you buy, uh, where did you get your supply chain? And the second one, uh, and the third one will be the payment flow. The payment flow is also important parts of the cross-border business. And the logistics is also the fourth one. So the four uh, elements is quite important during your business. You have to need to, uh, according to your area, to consider about these four elements of it. And I want to share uh, information about my, uh, from my presentation is I mentioned about the high, high sales commission from Amazon and eBay. Uh, it's about like 50, 15 percent uh, from Amazon uh, if you go into do a business to um, put uh, this up your products on Amazon and you sell out your product and Amazon will take 15 percent from you and also eBay is six percent plus nine percent which is pretty high and the listing fee is nine percent even if you don't sell anything you have to pay nine percent this is quite quite high from your, your product lines. And also the payment flow is from the PayPal. Maybe you would know this. Um, and the logistic is you can throw the FBA, which means fulfillment by Amazon. And this is also cost another fee according to your size of goods. So you will have a lot of costs if you're thinking about, you you can get into the Western market through Amazon. And another way you can build up your own website to, for a, to the Western uh, customer, but then you will have a, another huge cost is about the advertisement because you, you have to pay a lot of money from, because your own site is zero traffic and you have to pay a lot of money from uh, Google ads or Facebook. Uh, as I know, they're pretty high. So you can think about it. If your business, your product is the high price or with a good quality and you want to do your own brands on this famous Amazon and that the global uh, consumer know your product is really good and you can go to that platform. And I also want to share, if you want to do some business in Asia, like I have talked before is Taobao and Tmall, their feed is low. And Tmall commission is 5%. And the, they will charge you the annual tech, technical fee uh, and the deposit, but it's pretty low. It's like 9,000 uh, US dollar. It's not that much. It's just a deposit and the annual technical fee. And lucky, Taobao is no fee. and a very low deposit is about US, uh, US dollar 100. So that's why I started my business from Taobao because uh, the cost is really, really low. So uh, I would think you can consider about, and the payment flow can go through by Ali Global and the tax and the logistic and taxes in China, there has three ways. I'll quickly explain here is the customer declaration, or you can just send your POCO by ENS. Uh, it's tax free if your POCO value is under eight US dollar. And you can also have a third way is the bounded warehouse way, um, which means if you didn't sell your uh, products out and you can just, you, you don't need to uh, pay the taxes to the government and, you, and your products you just uh, since overseas products. So this is also a good way you can think about it. So in the conclusion, I, was, I would want to um, explain to you is first, know your customer well. And the second, combine your passion. And the third, considerate your cost. And I hope that'll be helpful for you guys.
Rachel, that was a great way to wrap up. Um, first of all, thank you so much to all of our panelists. I apologize for going over. You all are, um, we had so many questions and there were so many aspects that I wanted to dig more into. So I hope that you will uh, join us again for future webinars. Um, thank you so much for giving us your time and letting us um, learn more about the amazing, important work you're doing and all of your insights. Um, I would like to turn it over now just to uh, our country director, Ryan Evangelista, um, for our final thoughts. Thank you so much, Sujan. I think this is one of those sessions that we don't mind going over time and we can go on the entire day because the richness of the discussion is just amazing. I'm so thankful to our dear panelists, Dr. Zakir Mahmoud of the SME Center of University of Indonesia, Gina Romero of Connected Women, Wekta Guzman of Social Fellow, and Rachel Chan of Kairos International for their expertise, experience, and great contribution and passion in supporting MSMEs improve their capabilities to access new markets through various digital tools, platforms, and programs amid the challenges of COVID-19. And Shujana, congratulations for an excellent job in moderating our panel discussion. You all inspire us and our work to strengthen the public policy dialogue and ecosystem for MSME representation around the world. I would also like to thank the Women Business Council Philippines and the Philippines LGBT Chamber of Commerce for being our event partners. COVID-19 has indeed changed the way we do and view things around us. Expertise and knowledge need to converge and be shared to enable building blocks of tools and ideas for effective response and recovery of affected enterprises. As our panelists espouse, there are new opportunities to drive MSME success amid the challenges of COVID-19. Thus, businesses can be supported in reorienting their mindset and capacities to be more resilient this underscores the value of digitalization as a driver for business model reorientation of small, micro, small, and medium enterprises. In institutionalizing digital transformation, it is inevitable to have a broader understanding of the risks, the capacity, and needed policy interventions to support a more structured and seamless digital transition, particularly for micro, small, and medium enterprises. We need to engage the private sector, government, academia, and business service providers proactively to encourage businesses to achieve business continuity and a whole business approach to resiliency where digital transformation serves as a means and not the end. As such, we must be mindful of the following thrust in supporting digital transformation. And I learned this from my takeaways in the discussion. Engage MSMEs as our primordial, as our primordial partners. Establish digital contact points for MSMEs to become self-aware of their business model transformation needs and the discipline of business continuity and opportunities with digital transformation. Enforce the e-commerce ecosystem where the private sector, academia, and government drive policy, public policy dialogue for ease of doing business and business enabling environment. Some of this as illustrated by our panelists include internet transactions policies, cybersecurity, data privacy, e-commerce infrastructure, consumer protection, taxation, business registration and licensing, intellectual property, and trade facilitation. And expand digital platforms catering to industry investment innovation linkages and market access opportunities for enterprises. Digitalization seemed to be a daunting task for MSMEs, but with the right foundation and continued support in implementing cohesive strategies for ease of doing business and enabling environment that lead to clear goals, we'll be able to harness opportunities brought about by the growth of digital economy, such that regulatory quality and coherence for streamlining regulatory processes will be critical. But, we, but must be finally balanced with the need to ensure that appropriate standards are met. We need to advance public policy advocacy agenda and recommendations for market-oriented policy reforms that encourage ease of doing business, inclusive infrastructure access, and participation in digital economy. We also need to advance fiscal and non-fiscal incentives where government can take a look into providing targeted incentives using policy tools, such as investment priority plans with the goal of integrating incentives package to promote recovery in the various sectors with particular focus on supporting technology integration, R&D and innovation initiatives, and supply chain management. We also need to strengthen digital infrastructure 
where government and private sector can set up proper infrastructure to support digital revolution and equitable platforms for digital economy participation. Skills training with the private and public stakeholders taking proactive stakes st 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 and initiatives to boost skills in digital services and technology. Connected Women is doing this in partnership with technical vocational education and training institutions such as TESDA, which is vital to support skills development upgrading. And finally, Supplier Development Initiative, where supply, local supplier development program can be institutionalized as part of the broader industry investment and global value chain supply chain linkages to encourage micro, small, and medium enterprise, including indigenous enterprises, in filling in the gaps in the sector supply chains. A supplier development program can help accelerate the transfer of technology, skills, and innovation through institutional partnerships between companies undertaking resilient industrial recovery. Consumer awareness and protection is very in vital as well in ensuring that the protection regime for consumers is strengthened based on international and regional standards to facilitate greater cohesion and trust in cross-border online trade. The speed and type of digital transformation can come at the expense of risk, or the entire initiative can cause more harm than good for our micro and small enterprises. It is critical that all the risk factors be considered in the design of digital transformation initiatives so that new processes do not weaken the overall risk profile of the enterprises participating in the digital economy. As such, SITE continues to develop tools and programs to support our stakeholders to navigate and and strengthen their accord in an enabling environment for digital economy. In this regard, we're happy to share an online training toolkit in creating an enabling environment for digital economy that you all can access on SIPE's website. And we're flashing the URL link on our screen at this point. I would like to extend my big gratitude to our colleagues at SIPE. Andrew Wilson, our Executive Director, Abdul al Kebsi, our Managing Director for Programs, John Merle, our Asia Pacific Regional Director, Pamela Kelly Lauder, our Director for Communications, and Anna Kompanek, Director for Global, for your leadership and support in all our activities. My big thanks also go to our great collaborators at the Global team with Louisa, Morgan, and Adam, our Asia team family, Kathy, Jenny Gibson, and Jenny and Gibson and the rest of the Asia team and Autumn and the entire team at the communications unit for and my amazing colleagues in Manila, Sujan and Janessa for all their hard work and contribution in making this three-part webinar series on technology and democracy a huge success. We will be back for more webinars in the coming weeks. To everyone who participated in our webinars, our big thank you. I wish you a pleasant day and please stay safe, everyone. Thank you again and good night and good day to all of you in Asia. Thank you, everyone.